Welcome, friends, to this service of worship on Trinity Sunday. There is obviously a lot going on in our world at the moment. So to those of you who yearn for justice, to those of you who long for peace, to those of you who are hungry for hope, let me invite you now to come in to this sacred space and join us in this holy time so that you might worship and be fed. And let me invite you now to join with me in our call to worship. Let us worship the living God, the eternal one who creates and sustains us. We will raise our voice in praise. Let us worship the risen Christ, the incarnate one through whom God was revealed. We will raise our voice in thanks. Let us worship the divine spirit, the holy one who renews and strengthens us. We will worship the triune God. Join me now in our unison prayer, saying together, God, our creator, you sent the word made flesh to reveal your love for the world and your spirit to breathe us and lead us into new life. Through their presence and work among us, we come to know the mystery of your own life, a life lived in and through relationships of mutual love. Open our eyes this day to see your presence in one another, and open our hearts to practice this same love 
for one another. Through Christ we pray. Amen. As we prepare now to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray. We confess this day, O God, that we are hungry for food that money cannot buy. Bring these ancient words to life now by your living spirit. Breathe your very breath into them that they might become for us your living word. Amen. The good news comes to us today from Matthew's Gospel. This is the so-called Great Commission. It's the closing scene in Matthew's Gospel where Jesus gives his followers one last charge. So as we prepare to hear these words read and uh, proclaimed, I invite you to listen for God's living word to you. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When he saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today on the church calendar, we celebrate Trinity Sunday. That's almost topical in a sense, because at this moment in history, we happen to find ourselves in the middle of a kind of triune crisis, the likes of which that not even the oldest among us have ever seen before. By now, the nature of this unholy trinity is all too familiar. A once every hundred years global pandemic, a once in a century economic crisis, and now, layered on top of this already potent mix, widespread racial and social unrest that is tearing at the seams that hold our country together. These things are so serious, so upsetting, so pressing, so real, I think it's fair to ask what difference it makes for us to celebrate the Trinity today. In the text I read just a minute ago, Jesus charges his disciples to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If that's all the Trinity is, a baptismal formula, or a creedal formulation that is, sounds sort of stirring when we say it today, then, honestly, the fact that we celebrate Trinity Sunday today makes very little difference in the overall scheme of things. But if the nature of the Divine One is, in fact, triune, if the nature of the one God is inherently three, that might make an enormous difference. Now, I grant that some of you watching this might find that hard to believe that the one God is inherently three. It's never made rational sense to anyone. But if that's true, if that's hard to believe, I have really good news for you today. You are in good company. I don't know if you noticed this detail in the story, but I, there's a point in there that's, I, that is helpful on this point, I think. Matthew says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. The resurrected Christ is standing right in front of them, and some doubted. Clearly, doubt is not an enemy of faith. So you ha if you have trouble with this idea that the one God is inherently three, I think God is big enough not to be threatened by that. But if that's true, first of all, if that, I would invite you to open your mind and your heart to the possibility that it is true. But if it is true, and I'm going to stipulate and affirm that it is, if that's true, if the nature of the one God is inherently three, it means that God exists in and for and through 
relationships. And this cosmic level reality, in turn, has direct and real world implications in our little sphere, right, in the, right here and right now. Because it means that God, the creator, can only be God in relationship to and with God, the redeemer, who can only be in relationship to and with God, the Holy Spirit. As Jürgen Moltmann, the great theologian of the Trinity, has pointed out, it is a relationship of mutual and interdependent love. It also means that God exists in and for and through diversity. To repeat, God the Creator can only be God in relationship to and with God the Redeemer, who can only be in relationship to and with God the Holy Spirit. Which is to say, each member of the Trinity is different in identity and purpose and function, and these differences are essential to God's very life, to God's very being, to the nature of God's work right here in our world. Without these differences, God is not God. God is God because of these differences, in virtue of them. Now, I grant that this may still sound rather far off, overly theoretical, overly theological, perhaps inconsequential to human life and experience. But the Trinitarian nature of God matters because we are made in the image of God the image of the triune God. Which is to say that, like God, we human beings are built for relationship. I cannot be me without you. You cannot be you without me. African culture understands this better than we do here in the in highly individualized West. And I say African culture because this idea is really it's found throughout the continent. It's expressed, though, perfectly in the Zulu word Ubuntu. I am because we are. I am because we are. That is a direct variation, a direct expression of the nature of the one God who is inherently three. I am because we are. If you don't believe that's true, try living without and apart from human relationships. Now, granted, some people do live apart from them, but for the overwhelming majority of us, if we try to do that, if we, were, if we try living without and apart from human relationships, it would not take long for our isolation to leave us feeling diminished, unwhole, not ourselves. Oh, wait. We don't have to try to do this. It sort of feels like that's how we've all been living for the last three months. So let me ask, is anybody else tired of that? I know I am. Is any, does anyone else long to be able to walk up to a friend you haven't seen in weeks or months and just give them a hug? I know I long for that. So this theological question is also ontological, if you will. That is, the nature of God has a direct bearing on human nature and experience. And we see this and we know this because, like the nature of the Trinity, we need one another to be whole. And also, like the Trinity, we need our diversity to be fully human, to be fully ourselves. Humanity is at its best. Humanity most closely reflects and expresses the divine image, the divine nature, when we honor and celebrate our differences. Differences of age and gender and race and sexuality and culture and belief and language and calling and purpose, all of those things. Is it hard to honor that diversity? Of course it is. Almost every day the news reminds us of how hard it is to do that. But maybe it's only hard because we don't take the time to try, or because we start in the wrong place, perhaps at too high a level. Maybe the best place to start is by simply looking someone in the eye. For sure, now make sure you wear a mask and stay six feet apart when you do that. But what would it be like if on occasion, we all took the time to look into the eyes of someone who is fundamentally different from the way we are, 
and then to affirm the world is better because we are both in it together. I am better because you are in it. You are better because I am in it. Uh, I am because we are. You are because we are. That is Trinitarian theology practiced on the individual real world level. What difference might make that might that make in the real world? Well, imagine. Imagine if the four police officers who detained George Floyd had approached that confrontation with Ubuntu in mind, with Trinitarian theology deep in their hearts. Instead of putting his knee on George Floyd's neck, imagine if Derek Chauvin had taken the time to look Mr. Floyd in the eye. Imagine if he had taken the time to hear his voice, to consider his plea for help, which was in effect his plea to be recognized as a human being made in the image of God. Just imagine that. And now let me invite you to join me in our unison affirmation of faith. We believe in God who gives us steadfast love and shares with us our joy and sustains us in our suffering. We follow Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. In him we are offered forgiveness from sin, renewal from failure, reconciliation from brokenness, release from despair. We are guided by the Holy Spirit, God's presence in the world. By the Spirit we are called into Christ's community to celebrate his love, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to share with him in baptism and to eat at his table. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. If this is your first time worshiping with us in this way, worshiping with us as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, let me invite you to perhaps push pause and take a moment to gather the elements that you will need to share in this meal together with all of us. I am convinced that the Jesus we read about in Scripture would prioritize participating in this meal over the nature of the elements themselves. So whatever you have available, gather that together at table and join us now as we celebrate this holy meal. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Creator God, for the gift of life itself, for the matchless blessing of creating us in your image, we give you thanks. O Jesus, our brother, for coming to earth, for calling us your friends, for your sharing in our life and in our pain, we give you thanks. O Spirit of grace and truth, for revealing yourself in community, for healing us in our brokenness, for inspiring us with courage to do the work Jesus gave us to do, we give you thanks. God of justice and peace, we know, that we know through our sacred stories that you stand with those who are poor, with those who are oppressed, with those who are vulnerable, with those who are on the margins. So now, in our own homes, in our own voices, we call upon you to be present with and for those who suffer the injustice of violence. O oh God, in our own homes, in our own voices, we call upon you today to strengthen those who carry heavy burdens and to touch those who need healing with your healing grace. O 
in our own homes, in our own voices, O God. We call upon you to give us courage to look our neighbors in the eye and see in them the face of Christ. Spirit of the living God, present with us now, breathe in us and on these gifts of bread and wine that sharing in this sweet meal, we may experience your presence among us, uniting us across time and distance. And hear us now as we pray together the prayer of Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We don't know exactly what happened that night. All four gospel writers tell the story a little bit differently. But we do know it went something like this. That on the last night of his life, Jesus sat together with his disciples at table and he took the bread and after he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this bread is my body broken now given now for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, the, the cup of the Passover feast, poured it out, and said, this, this is the cup of, a new, of the new covenant. It's filled with my blood, filled with my very life. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you now, let us all keep the feast together. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life, renewed us for your service. May our love be your love, reaching out into the life of the world to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
So friends, go out now and may the grace of the risen Christ be with you. The presence of God surround and sustain and support you. The peace, love, power, and joy of the Holy Spirit fill you today and always. Amen. Amen.